What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of We Talk Money. My name's Chris Dunn. I'm your host, and today I'm with Nikki from She Talks Finance. She's a certified financial planner and full-time stock investor. We've also got Travis, aka the Stock Geek, who is a former hedge fund pro investor turned self investor, self manager. <laughs> <laughs> today we've got quite a bit on the docket. Um, Half of Americans don't know the stock market is up this year. What the hell is up with Where's that? Where's the wah, 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 wah. wah. <laughs> <laughs> What is going on with that? So what was it? Oh, Financial man. Times came out with an article talking about, I guess they kind of made it political too, but two thirds of Americans don't feel the benefits of Wall Street. And it looks like about half of them don't even know that the market's up this year. That's crazy. I mean, the market's up like, S&P 500 is up like 28% year to date. The NASDAQ's up like 30 and yeah, it blows my mind that there are people that either think the market's down or just like are totally about, oblivious yeah, about the, it. Yeah. I mean, they and went through th three different scenarios. Right. And the fact that they all didn't say it increased in value is kind of mind blowing. Yeah. It's, it's not subjective. It's <laughs> data. Yeah. It's numbers. It, it happened. It <laughs> happened. So yeah. this is what I think is even crazier. 60% of Republicans. Okay. So the, the question is this, uh, how has the value of the stock market changed since the beginning of the year? About 60% said it's increased in value uh, with Republicans. Less than 30% of Democrats think the market has gone up in value. What is going on, guys? <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's got to be this, like, this classic, like, media bias, right? Like, the fact that now, like, every cable news network is just pushing their own agenda and, like, you know, when a Republican president is in session, like all the Democrats think the world is going to shit and vice versa. When we had a Democratic president, all the Republicans thought like the economy was just tanking, even though actually like under Obama, the market was pretty much increasing every year. Right. It's, it's so Nikki, how do we stay objective? How do we stay unbiased and, and understand the facts of what's actually happening? Well, I mean, knowledge is power, right? Like people just in, instead of looking at it as like looking at your political, you know, agendas and views, uh, it's just data. Like, don't think of it, don't get so wrapped up in it, so emotional about it. Just well, why do you think, uh, like, so many people don't even know it's up? Do they not, are they not invested or do they just not know what the market's doing? What's the problem? I think that that's definitely part of it. I think that a lot of people, especially that have 401ks or IRAs at work, You'd be surprised how many people I come across, they have no idea that they're even invested in the stock market. Wow. Like, I literally ask them, I'm like, oh, well, you know, what do you think about your 401k in the market? Blah, blah, blah. And they're like, I, I don't have stocks. And I'm like, uh, yes, you do. You do have <laughs> stocks. They don't. And this is this is not their fault. Right. Like people are not taught these things. People mm. are not taught half half the time. People are getting into these 401ks and either they're auto enrolled in them and they don't they don't ever look at what it's invested in or don't look at what's going on. They just kind of go with it and, and they just don't know. So I think that it's just, a, it's simply just people becoming more educated about f financial literacy, right? Like that will help improve this, you know, it Absolutely. doesn't matter if you're a Democrat or a Republican or an independent or whatever, the market went up this year and your political views have nothing to do to do with it. Yeah. So, so Trav, how much is the market up this year and what does that look like? I, I know we've got a chart here. We can yeah, look I mean, the S&P 500 is up about 28% year to date. The Nasdaq's up about 30% year to date. Uh, most of the European indices are up as well. They're up mid twenties percentages. Now I will say, you know, a big part of the, that uh, big gain this year is because at the end of 2018, there was a big market correction. So yeah. a big chunk of that actually was, was the gain we had in the spring when the market just bounced back but you know especially over the last month or two the markets continued to extend its gains we're pretty much at all-time highs in the s p 500 uh so yeah so you know call it 25 30 percent year to date that's a really strong return that's one of the decades better uh market returns yeah so if we look at this I, you know i'm a chartist i know we, we all enjoy charts and ta um so the year started here right basically after kind of the the year in selling right so we had let me just run a percentage. So basically from this little top here, early December, um, right before, I guess this was like Christmas Eve last year was the low, right? And you, Trav, you were actually aggressively buying stocks here on Christmas Eve, right? Yep, that's right. What, what's the story behind that? What happened? What were you doing? Well, yeah, I mean, the market had, the market had corrected dramatically in October, November, and December. And 
you know, in December, especially like the volume had dried up because a lot of people went home for Christmas and there were just a lot of really phenomenal companies on sale. And so I was, I had been, you know, slowly buying in and into some companies in October and November, but right then on that Christmas Eve, I think it was like the third or fourth trading day in a row where, uh, you know, the market was down two or 3% and the volume was kind of drying up a little bit, but there was just some amazing bargains. And so literally, I think I was, um, you know, I was there buying it at my fiance's uh, family's house and, you know, skipping breakfast and everyone was wondering where I was and I was <laughs> on my phone buying stocks on that <laughs> half day trading day. But a lot of people probably didn't even know the market was open that day. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It was only a half day trading day. Um, but yeah, it was one of those opportunities where you just, you know, if you were paying attention, there were some amazing bargains mm -hmm. to be had. So nice and nice little V bottom bounce that led us to start the year right here on the S and P 500. And again, like you said, I mean, part of, I guess the reason why people don't think that the market's up is because it's not up that much from the high water mark of last year, right? Like if you look at the peak of last year, which was here around 2950 on the S and P it's up what about seven or 8%, maybe about 8% since the high of last year. Yeah. That's not insignificant. I mean, that's still pretty nice, but it's I don't know. In line with the market's yeah, average, average annual return. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. So if, if you were one of those people who pays attention to the market and understands when to buy, you could have exponential alpha over just what the high of last year was. Yeah. And Travis, you know, when we saw that sell off in December, were you thinking about like the actual PE ratio of the market as a whole and kind of weighing that um, as far as value goes? Definitely, because, definitely. Uh, looking at where we're at now, I think we're at what, 18 price to earnings ratio in yep. the S&P. Well, back in uh, December of last year, that price to earnings ratio looked way more attractive. Yeah, mm. I think it had gotten down to 14 or slightly sub 14, which was, you know, about three points lower than the, you know, 10 or 20 year average. And, and what does that mean for anybody that doesn't understand like the, the PE ratio of the S and P? What is that? Yeah, that's the price to earnings ratio. That's basically the market cap of the S and P 500 companies, uh, divided by the earnings of those companies. And so it's a measure of the value of the companies versus the amount that they, they, they're earning annually at that. So time. if you look at like the top 500 companies in the U S look at their earnings and kind of figure out where that is in the grand scheme of things. Yeah. And there's several data uh, providers that publish that number. So you can pretty much at any day in the year, see what the not only trailing 12 month earnings for the S and P 500 is, but also the expected earnings for the, for the coming 12 months. And, um, and a lot of people also like to flip that ratio over and so take an earnings yield. So it's just the PE ratio flipped over. It's the earnings divided by the price and, and they'll compare that to say bond yields and, and, you know, bond yields had, um, had come in a lot. And so, especially when you're looking at, you know, I think it was, you know, a 2% or two and a half uh, percent, uh, bond yield, 10 year bond yield at that time versus, um, you know, the S and P 500 yield had reached, you know, six or 7%. Um, and you know, obviously they're not apples to apples comparable, but you basically you could see that rates had come in a lot and the stock market had come in even further and was offering a pretty juicy yield relative to other investments. And so you can sometimes look at those things and use those as a, as a determination of whether the market's, you know, cheap or expensive. And it can give you sometimes a directional indicator of, um, you know, is the market getting to a level where historically it's made sense to buy? And gotcha. so, so is it on sale and is it, worth taking a stab exactly. at. Yep. Cool. So that leads us, we're coming into the holiday season. Um, let's talk about some retail holiday trends. What's going on in the markets? What do you guys see? There's a battle right now in the retail space between the haves and the have nots. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Target so, and Lululemon is over here killing it and Walmart. And then over here you got Kohl's and you've got e, uh, Forever 21 and oh, yeah. just J.C. Penney, J.C. Penney, oh, Macy's. Serious. So you got some clear winners and some clear losers. Clear winners and clear losers, absolutely. I think I saw. I didn't look at the report, but I think GameStop this week reported uh, a negative comp of uh, like negative twenty five percent or something. Meaning Ooh. this year's sales uh, for the most recent quarter were twenty five percent lower than the same time last year. I oh mean, we God. all saw that coming, though, didn't we? Oh yeah, that company doesn't need to exist anymore. <laughs> I don't think, but <laughs> so, Sorry, so who's, GameStop. So who's the hero <laughs> of this year? GameStop is the the want want who's the winner of this year of retail yeah i would say either target or lululemon or both i mean both so yeah. you both have been heavy in lulu over the past couple of years right 
Yeah, we've been ho- oh, we got into Lulu in seventeen, two thousand seventeen, uh, right? I, I need a womp womp moment because <laughs> I'm actually out of it, so I've missed the last couple months of games. I womp womp. S- <laughs> oh, I sold too early. Uh, I'm still holding this sucker, but yeah. I, there's there are fundamental reasons behind that. Yeah, like me uh, having to go buy my fiance's her Christmas presents there. Everyone's going to Lululemon for Christmas presents this year. Nice. Yeah. It's okay. Good stuff I buy for myself too. So, so Lulu's a winner. Walmart's crushing it. We've got losers. What else is happening in the markets that is being affected by the trade war? I know that's been a big topic on everybody's mind. How how is that affecting things from you guys' perspective? I mean, retail obviously it's affecting retail. Oh yeah, most of the retail sector is down pretty hard. Even like especially the mall retailers. Like if you pull up like you know Abercrombie, A and F, or um, you know. American Eagle, yep. ADO, yeah. or stocks like that. Um, mm. Most of those, Nordstrom. Abercrombie's you know. been an interesting one, though, because they've actually been pulling manufacturing out of China for a while now, and they're um, projecting to be under 20% manufacturing in China. So they've kind of they kind of got ahead of it. Um, but a lot of other a lot of other retailers aren't so lucky, and yeah. they're feeling the the pain. It's funny, yeah, it's interesting because a lot of those retailers are getting <coughs> compressed from both sides. On the cost side, the cost of their goods to manufacture their goods has gone up because of tariffs. And then on the other side, they're having to lower their prices because it's a become a like promotional retail environment. Except for companies like Lululemon that yeah. have really strong pricing power, most of the mall retailers have had to like put stuff on sale to move goods. And so that promotional price environment has lowered the price that they are charging consumers while at the same time the costs have risen so their margins have gotten crushed so squeezing their profits out yeah in fact a couple of these retailers this pa- over the past couple of weeks we had the retailers reporting their uh, q3 earnings results and a lot of what we saw a big trend that we saw was that um comps actually held up okay meaning like year over year sales growth was either flat or positive but the margins the gross margins in the business and operating margins in the in the business uh basically got squeezed interesting so okay. profitability is lower this year um so maybe this trade deal it looks like today we got the for phase one agreement uh between china and the u.s that has finally come to fruition and maybe that will help to turn the tide <coughs> yeah gotcha retailers okay awesome so uh we're coming up on the end of earning season any outstanding plays that you guys have been in over the past few weeks or interesting stocks you had that one right in the with domo um yeah i had domo they ha- they came out with earnings this so week. domo is a software company that does bi i believe yep bi software um yeah so domo uh was essentially a swing trade mm-hmm. and there were some fundamental components that i took it this is kind of an example of combining the fundamentals with the technicals of technical analysis yeah and um this was one that where did you get in? Uh, seventeen sixty was my average. About actually. what time? Um, it was around right, like see, yeah, like around there. I bought it Mid-September. after the last earnings report. I don't okay, know. Okay, the so they had a gap day. down and yep. it was bouncing, and yeah. you bought here in the Stock seventeen range. Stock gap down about twenty twenty five percent after their uh, Q two earnings release. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was down pretty big um, there. Yeah, and then, so what happened? They had a turnaround. Yeah, well, basically what happened was when earning, first of all, this had a really high short interest. So I was kind of looking for like a short squeeze-esque opportunity. Yep. But um, the losses that, that the company w- were having actually were sh- um, smaller than what was anticipated. So I think that really helped, right, Travis? Kind of. Yeah, you'll see that gap up. So we, s- we talked about the gap down after the Q2 earnings, and then I think you s- noticed that the CEO had a huge insider buy. Yeah, as the well. CEO the had short a interest, the insider million buy. Dollar in, n- no, million dollars, right? Yeah, yeah a million been... dollars worth of shares the CEO bought gotcha. before yeah. earnings. But yeah, going into earnings, you can see like that the chart was actually, you know, technically starting to work. Like it was, it was, um, basically filling in looking like it might fill in that gap yeah. and then they you see that it gapped up back up to the mid 20s again on the Q3 results which were g- looked pretty good because revenue growth actually reaccelerated and their net loss narrowed so they were losing less money than um, they had been in the prior quarters nice so nice play it's good to get on the right side of things like that yeah, and that's just a great example of taking everything and putting it all together to form a thesis and have good risk management and, you know. 
Sounds That's good. What happened. So interesting stuff in the stock market. Uh, we'll go ahead and move over to the crypto section and taking a look at Bitcoin over the past week. We've basically just been squeezing around 7,500. Uh, technically, if we look at, you know, just market structure, which I've talked about in prior videos, you know, I look at kind of the macro picture and ask, are we in bullish price structure or bearish? And for most of the year, we've been bullish. We actually had a breakout here around the spring where we bought the breakout around 4K. And then we had higher highs and higher lows all the way through the summer. And then we shifted to a bear market here in September. Timber. And then you can see price has been really struggling, but kind of holding up over the past couple of months around this 7K level. Um, so overall, you know, immediate bearishness on Bitcoin. But uh, there are some interesting things that happened this week. Number one was uh, the government went ahead and busted another massive Ponzi scheme. Uh, this one was called BitClub. Um, basically, you know, during 2017, a lot of this shit was really prevalent where you know, a lot of bad actors came into the crypto market trying to hop on the bandwagon, ran a lot of scams, and that is now starting to catch up. They, they're they basically busting the, the biggest ones at this point, and um, I think that's a good thing. I think we need to, to prune the, the crap out of the crypto yeah. space. Yeah, it feels like a lot of that, from an outsider's perspective, feels like a lot of the, the bad actors have started to get washed out, and, like, the crypto market's now starting to turn to, like... Um, real projects starting to gain more value and then also like actual cool, interesting uh, products launching and things like that, like the crypto domains this week. And yeah, and yeah, that was an interesting one. Unstoppable domains came out and launched dot crypto, which is a decentralized um, version of domain names um, where you have control, GoDaddy or HostGator or whoever can't take that control away from you. It also acts as a crypto wallet address. So you could send money to chrisdunn.crypto and I could direct that to whatever Bitcoin wallet I want. So I'm a huge fan of anything that makes it easier for your average person to come into the crypto space. Yeah, yeah it's pretty rad. Yeah. And then isn't, what is um what is Brave up to now? Because I, aren't they up to like five or 10 million active users? The last that I saw was 10 million active users and... That's pretty big. I mean, you know, their uh, their token has been relatively flat or bearish. Um, I own some of this that I've been kind of accumulating down at support. Uh, but again, I, I think this is a much, much longer term play. Um, it, and, and it's a crapshoot. You know, we don't know if they're going to be able to ultimately take significant market share from Chrome and Firefox. But I like anything that's privacy centric and, and also gives people a way to integrate crypto into the economics of a browser, right? Where you can like automatically donate to content creators. So yeah. that was pretty cool. It's, I mean, 10 million, that's real traction. I mean, that's what it like, is. that's what like the kind, that's the kind of thing that like the crypto ecosystem, you know, needs is like things with real users, real traction at like a, you know, somewhat, somewhat of a, of a pretty big scale. I mean, 10 million users. Like That's a, that's a great start. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And Google's certainly not doing anything to like improve their image of like, you know, they used to be the don't be evil company. And now like everyone knows that like, that's kind of bullshit. Like Google's got all this other stuff they're doing. That's pretty shady. Yeah. There seems to be a split between the social media giants where you got Twitter is like, I'm not going to allow uh, political ads. And then Facebook's like, yeah, we don't really care. We want the revenue. What do you guys <laughs> yeah. think about that? I mean, I mean, yeah, it's kind of like reflective almost of like the political split in the country too. Yeah. In a yeah. Way. Like, yeah. Um, or yeah, I don't know. It's, I I think like, I think there's to me th there should be like some middle ground, but I, I guess it's just difficult at scale to like. No, Travis, you must pick a side. <laughs> there is no middle ground. There is no room for pragmatic thought in uh, today's society. I mean, these are the aches and pains of technology, right? Like as we go through and innovate, we're gonna have these situations that companies are gonna have to figure it out, like privacy, political ads, uh, you know, uh, just, I don't know. I don't know what's going to come of it, but yeah, it's just even like stuff like uh, fake accounts and fake news and, you know, mm -hmm. how do you police all of this? Impersonators, that's something I've been dealing with for a few years. Uh, yeah, it's, I don't know. I, I don't know if there's an easy answer to it other than 
get behind the companies that are actually developing real products and solutions for it. Yeah. So decentralized privacy centric stuff I think is the the wave over the next few years I just love the idea that you'll have an option to use a product that like you can you you, you can monetize your like like brave for instance where you can monetize your data like if, yeah. if you want to see ads then you get paid you have for the choice that. yeah, or yeah you have the choice um, I just think that I hope that in like 10 20 years time like there are more products like that where we can choose like where it's not just like Oh yeah, you either have to pay a lot for a product, or you like you, you are know, the product. You are the product. Yeah, it's yeah. Like maybe there's some model that is actually, you know, better. Agreed. So Nikki, to wrap up today, we've got the end of the year coming up. Let's put on your CFP hat. Um, <laughs> what are some things that people on. need to know? What are some new things or just things to prepare for 2020? Okay. Yeah, I got two things. The first thing is we're coming up towards the end of the year, so anybody that's wanting to open up any kind of uh, qualified plan, like a 401k. Like if you're a business owner, you can actually do a solo 401k. Um, or if you own a business and you wanna implement some type of retirement plan, uh, December 31st is the deadline to do that. As far as IRAs go, like your traditional or Roth IRA, you have till next year to deal with that. But um, that's something to know for sure. Good deadline to keep in mind. The second thing that's interesting in the crypto space is the IRS has proposed, it's actually in draft mode. I think it is actually happening. Last I looked, it was in draft, but they're proposing to add a question on our 1040 forms that basically asks if you dealt in crypto, essentially in 2000, in any way, in any year, whatever mm. year. Uh, it's, I, it's on my phone, so I don't have the exact wording, but um, it was if you've, sold exchanged acquired cryptocurrency did you do anything with crypto if so we're going to put you, you in this did, bucket we're going to look at you more closely and you know yeah. the irs have done this before with uh, offshore accounts there's mm. actually a question asking point blank uh do you have any offshore accounts so it's not like this is the first time that this has happened in this capacity but it's interesting because what it says to me is obviously they don't see crypto going away anytime soon. Yeah. Right. If anything, so it's, it's bullish because it's going to stick around. That's if they're where my mind went with it. Yeah. So keep that in mind because that's going to be hitting us. You know, if so get your documents in order, know what you did, know your buys and your sells and just get it all in order because you don't want to, you know, be caught off guard with that question. Awesome. <laughs> It, so final thoughts going into 2020. What are you guys excited about? What do you guys see? I mean, I'm, I don't know if I would call it excitement. The election year kind of has me a little bit like, uh, you know. Yeah. Here. Maybe some more volatility in the markets next I year mean, over that. Yeah. I guess it depends on the type of trader you are, you know. Uh, with any type of short-term trading, that type of volatility can really get choppy and chop you out and it can get kind of frustrating versus what we're seeing now, which is a nice trending mm. market. Um, so that's kind of what I go to. But Yeah, I expect a, it could be a, a choppy year with the, um, what's interesting about this election year is I, I think there's even more at stake than like maybe average elections because there has been this shift like on uh, from the Democratic side, for instance, to go pretty far left. A lot of the candidates are pretty far left. And so you have this scenario where there could be a big sea change in things like monetary and fiscal policy. Um, it, even just the market's assessment of that, like I, you've heard all these, you know, hedge fund managers get on CNBC and say like, oh, if, you know, Elizabeth Warren gets elected, the market's going to be down 10 or 20%, right? So people are already thinking about it. They're already starting to price that in, in certain ways. So yeah, that's going to pro provide volatility, but it's also getting me to think about like, okay, on an three or five or 10 year time frame, what trades might have optionality if those type of things play out. And, you know, it's things like, you know, could we be actually moving into a, uh, a more inflationary type environment, which like a lot of people will say rates are going to be low forever. We're going to be in deflation forever. And uh, assets seem to be priced that way right now. But that seems to be a very popular opinion, doesn't it? That yeah. we're in a we're in a forever zero interest rate environment. Yeah. I feel like and people have kind of accepted it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's generally true unless we get a sea change where, for instance, fiscal policy starts doing things like universal health care or basic income or student loan forgiveness. Those are so large in size that I think they could shift to 
uh, shift us into a new environment. And right now we're already seeing 3% increases in wages on a year over year basis. So, um, you know, again, this could be a sea change that causes like the next wave of, you know, market trend. Um, so I'm not like positioned yet for that, but I think it's interesting to think about where would you invest and what places might be interesting to invest should that come to pass. And on that or thought, even what you should stay away from. Yeah. Like yeah. Healthcare. I mean, I, I think like you guys said, I mean, no matter what happens, there's going to be opportunity and it's just kind of thinking about what are all the possibilities, what could happen. And if those scenarios play out, where's the opportunity, mm -hmm. right? Think about it now. Don't chase the trends once they're already apparent. Yes. So on that note, guys, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed this episode of We Talk Money. We will see you next week. Take care. Bye.